Hello, welcome everybody to ALC Our Home. This is our online service here at Abundant Life Church in Wellington. It's great to be back, Hannah. Yes, welcome back. We haven't had Lewis for quite a few weeks because he did a, ser- a series, a two-week series, sermon series, and then um, everything has just been slightly all over the place, but we're back on track, um, ready to take on the last four months of the year. Can you believe it? Oh, That's crazy, isn't it? It's going by very quickly. Yes. A lot of exciting things. And I know even this year, still exciting things to come. Yeah. We're what are we in 50 days of God conversations yes. and then we're in 21 days of prayer and fasting and yeah. then it's Christmas yeah. kind of a little bit uh, after that. Yeah. She, yeah, it's a little bit later, yeah. but still Christmas is coming yeah. um, and it's great, it's exciting yeah. and it's great that you can join us and you know, I hope you've been challenged by the, this kind of series we're mm. in, um, yeah. focusing on discipleship, following us in our response with mm. being church mentoring building yeah. people up oh it's been great and we're continuing that today aren't we yes we are we are going to kind of touching base continuing off of disciple making disciples as pastor and has been preaching over the last couple of weeks um today it's you know very much going to be as awesome as the last week and i know next week's as well as you might touch on things like obedience and so on so it's going to be really good so i encourage you that if you have a notebook around you or somewhere with you get that out to get ready to take some notes but before that we want you to feel like you're part of our family here at ALC. You know, one of the things that we strongly believe in is that we want to be a community, not just for our city, but beyond as well, and beyond includes you. So this morning, I believe Lewis will just take us over a couple of ways, and myself, of how you can be part of our community here at ALC. Absolutely. And one, one of the greatest ways to keep connected is by going onto Linktree. If you just go onto any uh, browser, you can do it now, is go onto linktr.ee forward slash ALCNZ. If you go on there, you'll be able to find everything you need we have all of our links, all of our weekly updates, emails, everything coming up is on there, and it's a great way to stay connected. I know for a lot of people overseas, um, the best way is to, uh, through our YouTube, we have Q&As that come out, and hopefully once uh, Pastor Hamish Ann to get into their new house, mm. we'll see some more of those. Yes. But um, a great way is we do have online prayer meetings as mm. well, so you can join us as we pray, um, I believe it's 7 p.m. Wednesdays, and that's in the weekly update, all the information there of how to do that. So I encourage you, go and have a look, join us in that. And yeah, also just feel free to email us at info at alc.org.nz and we'd love to have a conversation with you. You can also um, send prayer requests at prayer at alc.org.nz and we'd love to pray for you in this journey with mm. you. We yeah. want to do this with you. This is not something you can watch, but a church you can be a part of wherever you may be. And if you are in Wellington, feel free to join us. Yes. Feel free to join a connect group. There's yes. lots in the city. We'd love to see you. Yeah, I just want to echo that. We are here in Wellington City. So whenever you come by, if you're here on a holiday or if you are wanting to join a church or if you're in the city, please do join us. It's such an awesome community to be part of. Um, and also, yes, join that connect group because it was so key to have that. But here online, we like to do worship a little bit different. We like to do it through a scripture and prayer. Today, we'll be looking at it through the uh, reading of scripture. This is a time where you can um, just pray into um, what the word is going to be about today. Um, declare scripture over your lives, over every area that um, you know, you're currently needing that fresh touch of heaven. You can do that through just uh, scripture reading. Just ask the Holy Spirit to open up your hearts and your minds um, to be spoken to today. And then we'll hand over to Pastor Hamish after that. Let's do it. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Psalms 37 verses 23 to 24. Well, good morning, church. Welcome as we worship and as we prepare to open up the word together. Hey, if you're visiting with us online, we are a community of hope. We're so good, so grateful and so glad that you have taken the time to invest in your uh, spiritual growth just by taking some time out to let the Word and let the Holy Spirit work together in your life for your sake and for God's glory. And team, just thank you so much again for the worship. You know, this morning uh, I was looking at my notes for my message this morning confident that I had heard God but confident also there's some things that he was going to speak to me about um, close to the time and as you were leading us in worship suddenly uh, I felt, felt the God the Holy Spirit say this is what you need to do so um, and it all just flowed out of your obedience of how you led us this this morning in worship so thank you so much well guys we are going to open up the scriptures together um, 
This morning we are moving in a slightly different direction to what we have been over the last couple of weeks. The last couple of weeks we've been looking at one of our values which we're passionate about, which is disciples making disciples. And the reason we've been uh, talking about that is because as a community of hope, we believe that we've been called to make a difference in other people's lives, to live out of the fullness of the gospel that has changed us so that the hope that we've received, we would uh, build it into others so that collectively we can go and share that with uh, with others other people and help them become everything God is calling them to be as well. Um, this morning we're just going to um, this morning we are going to um, change that slightly. Um, sorry if I'm a little bit hesitant. I'm reading my notes and they're not the notes that I was just looking at 30 seconds ago when I was editing them. Um, <laughs> So I have no idea what I've done, but I have done something. But um, the reason we're sort of changing the tag slightly is that for some of you are aware that this year has been a year of transition for both Anne and I personally. Uh, she's entering into a, a new chapter of life, uh, having a significant birthday. Uh, with our families in a different place, we've sold our house, which has been really good for us because not having a house to live in while we wait to take possession of our house has been really good for our relationship because over the last five weeks, Anne and I have never had a cross word because we're nomads. Come on. I thought that was a, my best joke. But... Uh, but in the, in the context of that, what's been happening is that one of the things that I, you tend to do and, and change is you begin to reflect. You begin to ask yourself uh, about questions about life. And one of the questions I've been asking myself is, you know, as we mark a transition, as we get towards uh, that chapter in our life where we have more to look back on than we've got to look forward to in, in terms of ministry, in terms of all those sorts of things, is the question, what have, what have I accomplished? I've been spending a lot of time this year asking myself the question, what have I accomplished? And in the context of that, one of the things that has really challenged me is, is that I realize it's the wrong question. You see, the world says, what have you accomplished? The world gets you to ask, what have I accomplished? What have I achieved with my life? What, what have I, who have I influenced? Uh, what have I built? What have I done with my life? But Jesus doesn't ask you that question. Jesus asks a different question. He asks the question, who are you becoming? He doesn't say, what have you accomplished? He says, who are you becoming? Because identity is way superior to, uh, to behavior. Identity, who you are, is superior to simply focusing on what you do. Because what you do actually flows out of who you are. And so by asking the question, who am I becoming? That then answers the question, what have I accomplished? Because that flows as a natural byproduct out of who you've becoming. And the reason I think it's an important question to ask ourselves is, is who we're becoming is simply this. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then the more I'm like Jesus, the more peace I have, the more life I'm going to, to have, the more joy I'm going to have. The more my life is like Jesus, the more I'm going to have everything that Jesus has. That's why Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, he says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. You see, Jesus wants more for your life than, than you want for yourself. He wants our lives to overflow, not with riches in terms of the, the way the world understands them, although there's nothing wrong with that, but he, he wants our life to be rich, to be fulfilling, to overflow with the things that give meaning and purpose uh, that are not of this world, but reflect our relationship with God. And to the degree that we become everything that God's called us to, we are able to experience that. And so that's why we're spending some time over the next few weeks just unpacking this whole theme of becoming. It's the, the title of the series, Becoming. It's come up the next slide. Learning to live like Jesus. Because the more that we live like Jesus, the more we can have everything that Jesus promised us to be. The more that we learn to live like Jesus, then we can have that life and life in all its fullness. Because we're not focusing on things, we're focusing on becoming. We're focusing on becoming every, uh, the person that God has called us to be. And so I, a good thing to ask yourself is, when was the last time I, I just stepped back a little and asked myself, who am I becoming? 
you, you focus on careers, you focus on transitions into the next stage of life and all those things, but when was the last time you asked yourself the question, who am I becoming? And when I talk about who you're becoming, we're really talking about two things, growing in the character and in the life of Jesus. When we talk about growing in the character of Jesus, we're talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about Gal what he talks about in Galatians, where our lives are characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when we talk about living like Jesus, we're talking about are we serving like Jesus served? Are we loving our enemies? Are we giving to the poor? Are we making disciples? Are we living a life that pleases our Father? And if you want to know whether, how well you're doing on that, ask yourself the question, am I, am I becoming quicker to repent, quicker to apologize, quicker to ask forgiveness quicker, to extend forgiveness? Uh, are you becoming more loving, more gracious? Are you, um, are you becoming uh, more like the person Jesus wants you to be? Are the, is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life to the degree that it should? Simply put, is your life more faithful? Are you becoming more faithful, more hopeful, and more loving? Those are the questions that we should be asking ourselves on a, on a regular basis instead of what have I accomplished, instead of looking back on, uh, on our careers and looking back on what we've built for ourselves. And I'm not saying these things are wrong, but they should come after who we are becoming. We should be asking ourselves these types of questions because these are the things that reflect our relationship with Jesus. And, and I say all this because in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus says, Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. The student who will become, who, who, who is fully trained, will become like the teacher. That's the goal that Jesus has for your life and for mine. Not to acquire things, but to become like him. In the midst of everything that happens in life, his goal is that you and I will become like, like, like him. And, and that's, that's why we're doing this series. Next week we're going to dial it down a little and we're going to unpack some of, this sort, some, some of these um, themes in here, what it means to, to live like Jesus. Because the decisions you make now are going to impact your life in 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They're going to impact the life of ALC and they're going to impact the life of our nation. And I say that deliberately because who we are becoming as opposed to what we achieve, is more important to our nation than, than we give credit to. We're coming up to an election, and some of you are already starting to, to look at people's policies and everything else and determine who you vote for. And I want to suggest that most of us as Christians get it wrong. Not who do we vote for, but we fail to understand something significant. The reason who we're becoming is so mission critical is this. There's a term used to describe the Bible, uh, the Christians, the church in the Bible called Ecclesia. We've all heard of that, and we translate it as the called out ones. And so we talk about the church as the Ecclesia, the ones who are called out of this world to live like Jesus and all that sort of stuff. Got no problem with that. What you may not know is that it's actually a political term. It was actually... the. Uh, it's, used exclusively to, de to describe political parties, if you, if you want to use it that way. It was used to differentiate those who stood for this as opposed to those who stood for that, those who stood for this as opposed to, to that. And Paul, I think, was very deliberate in choosing a political term to describe the church because he was saying that you're called out to extend his kingdom. You're called out to achieve, to bring to, together, uh, to, to bring to pass God's plans for society. The hope of a nation does not rest in who's elected. The hope of a nation, the welfare of your neighbor is not determined exclusively by those who are in government. He's saying that the welfare of a nation, and Jeremiah talks about this as well, and the, and the, the welfare of your community is in your hands as Christians. Don't think that the church, the church is a politic in and of itself, rightly understood. And so for us to live our life, our calling, means that we need to become everything that Jesus has called us to do. You see, to be a disciple of Jesus is simply to be someone who seeks to become like him. Note that J Jesus is training us. You see, it's not something we, we have to work hard at to come up with, so what does it look like? We simply yield to him and let him train us. 
when you went to school, when you were at university, you didn't determine the curriculum. You didn't go to the teacher or to the, to the lecturer and say, okay, this is what you must teach me. This is what I want to learn. What happened was you went to, to school, you went to university, and your teacher, your professor, tr trained you. They set the curriculum. They told you what you were going to learn, and to the degree that you engaged with that, you became, you became more equipped and more like them. And it's the same for us. The more we become, uh, the, the more we yield to Jesus and to his way, the more we become like him. And, and I, I raise that because Paul talks in 2 Corinthians about how anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And you and I know this, but this is why we struggle with this and why we're doing this series. We know, and we know the, the truth of this, that we've become born again, that we're a new creation. But what happens is that so many of us struggle to live out of the reality and the truth of this verse. Our old life is gone, says, says Paul. When we become a Christian, we... we we are now a new creation. Our old life is gone, yet so often we live out of our old life. We've actually just added Jesus to our life rather than died to our old life and beginning to live the life of Jesus. This is why even though Jesus says that, you know, I want you to become like me, we struggle and we, we think it's a bit for other people is because this we've lost the, the reality of this, this verse here that says the old is gone. I think what happens is that we don't let this, this reality shape us. We either compartmentalize our faith and say, okay, so I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, and, and I'm, I worship him, and I go to Connect Group, and, and I, I know where my eternal destiny lies and all those things, but then I live my life the way everyone else is living. At work, I have the same conversations. I engage in the same office banter. I tell the same uh, jokes that everyone else does and, and all those things, and we compartmentalize our life, forgetting that, no, that old life is gone. The, the thought processes, the, the beliefs, and, and all those sorts of things. This is, and if we don't engage with this, how can we become the politic that, Jesus, that um, Paul envisaged us being, incidentally? The, the other reason I think we struggle with this is, is if we don't compartmentalize, we excuse ourselves. Oh, that's just the way I am. Have you ever said, that's just the way I am? Someone said something to you, someone's called you out on something, or, or you've read something in the Bible, or you've been in a connect group or a discussion, and someone says, the Bible says, and, and you look at your life and you excuse yourself, this is just the way I am. No, that's just the way you were, because you're a new creation. And so to become who God calls us to be is to begin to wrestle with this. What does it mean? What will it take for me to let go of my old beliefs, my old lifestyles, my old thought processes, um, my, my default settings, and begin to let the teacher mold me and shape me and fill me so I become like him? See, because we struggle with this, Paul writes a verse we're familiar with, and, and the connection for it in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I think should be 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You, if you treat your Bible as a life textbook, above Romans 12, 2, you should write 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So you make a connection, because he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, unless... We, we recognize the truth of 2 Corinthians 15, that we're, the old is dead, then what happens is we, we don't really engage with this. We talk about it, okay, I want to be a better person, but we're really thinking, I want to be a better version of my old self. But the old self is dead. And this is why we're saying, who are you becoming? Not who were you, but who are you becoming? And, and if we want to become who God is calling us to be, we need to begin to let him change and transform us by the way we think. By, and we, the way we think is influenced by, by God, by Jesus, by learning to study him and follow him, not copying the behaviors and customs of the world. You know, it, it concerns me that so many of us who are Christian in the workplace, there's no discernible difference between us and our colleagues who are not Christians. You know, I, I, a few years ago, I went to... to to a meeting to, to lunch with a guy who was a um, was a de deputy secretary of a of, of a ministry, uh, and he was a Christian, 
and I went into his office, he introduced me to a few people uh, as, his, as his minister, as I was at the time, uh, and we went off to lunch. And we, we came back and, and he was in his office, I was walking out, and someone introduced themselves to me. And uh, I had seen them once before, I didn't know that they were Christian, uh, I I'd, I'd just had a conversation with them at, at, a, at a meeting somewhere else. And they said, are you his minister? And I said, yeah, and they said, we didn't know he was a Christian. And I'm sitting there thinking, and I talked to him afterwards, and he says, oh, well, you know, they, they know I go to church. And I said, but you should be living your faith. You see, he'd compartmentalized. He wasn't becoming everything that God had called him to be. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You see, the reason I, I, I'm so opposed to, to people trying to compartmentalize their faith or simply add Jesus into their faith is that when you became born again, you were included in Christ when you received salvation. You were included in Christ. You were radically changed once and for all. You were born again. And the consequence of that is that whatever can be said of Jesus should be able to be said of you. Is Jesus righteous? So are you. Is Jesus holy? So are you. Is Jesus free? So are you. Whatever can be said of Jesus can be said of you because you're included in Christ. You're marked in him. So whatever can be said of him should be able to be said of you. That's why I ask the question, who are you becoming as opposed to what are you accomplishing? Because we're called to live this reality and to the degree that we live this reality we begin to experience the fullness of life that Jesus has for us and discipleship is simply the process of becoming who Jesus has called us to be it's to become everything that Jesus has has freed us in order to become it's learning to exchange our thoughts for his thoughts our behaviors for his behaviors our ways for his ways and about bringing all of these into alignment under Christ so that who we are is a reflection of him and that's why we that's why we're passionate about discipleship that's why we ask people to prioritize being part of a connect group because this is where we learn to do it because the reality is the bible says that you've been set free in Christ but many of us struggle to live like that don't we the Bible says that you're profoundly loved by God, yet the truth is that many of us don't really live as though we're profoundly loved by God. The Bible says that you're holy, but so many of us struggle to live lives that reflect the holiness of Christ. The Bible says all authority has been given to us, but we don't live like it has. And, and that's the process of becoming, closing that gap, aligning our lives with that of Christ so that what's said of him can now be said of us and we're living out of that reality so that we're able to be who he's called us to be, so that we can be the hope carriers that our hearts long for, that he wants us to be, so that we can experience the fullness of life. We can transform the marketplace. We can transform our communities simply by being as Jesus by living a life that is not compartmentalized, that is not excusing ourselves, but is engaging because regardless of whether we are just starting on our faith or we're seasoned campaigners, increasingly we are reflecting Jesus to those around us. And because it's a process, not a course to be followed, it's why we're committed to this value that we talked about the last couple of weeks, where we value disciples making disciples and helping one another become everything that God calls us to be because it's a process. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul says, My dear children, I feel as though I'm going through labor pains for you again, uh, going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Now, I don't know how you read this, but this passage tells me two things. The first is that becoming like Jesus is a painful experience. Now, I've never given birth, but I've been there for, for the, the birth of our three kids. And I have to tell you that, um, judging by the sounds that were coming from my, my, my beloved, that it wasn't a box of roses. That there was a, a great deal of pain, a great deal of effort involved. It was uncomfortable. 
And the reason I say that is, is that if we see this, then what do you do when you encounter something that's painful, something that's stressful, something that is uncomfortable? If you're like most people, your natural default is to avoid it. And this is why we say disciples making disciples is, is mission critical for us and what's good in your life as well is because we can hold each other accountable. We don't avoid the hard things. We don't avoid the painful things that are going to rob us of the promise of life, the fullness of life, the, the richness and, the, and the, the quality of life that Jesus has freed us to experience in him. So that we don't avoid the hard work of becoming more like Jesus so that we can bring his kingdom to bear. Second thing it tells me is when I read this is that no matter, uh, no matter who you are, how long you've been a Christian, if you're in relationship with others who are, you're, and you're seeking to encourage and to hold them accountable, you know, when they struggle, when they, when they blow it, don't give up. Paul is laboring with them and he says, I'm doing it again. The inference being he's been there before with them and they're going around and they're not getting it, but he doesn't give up because he wants them to become um, fully developed in Christ. He wants them to experience everything that Christ has for them. This is why we're saying we're committed to disciples making disciples, not attending courses, not ticking boxes, but doing life together, and why we're passionate about connect groups, because this is where this happens. We can encourage each other. We can celebrate with one another. We can become everything that God has called us to be. And the reason I'm majoring on this is that unless we become more like Jesus. You're going to become vulnerable to the enemy because the first part of John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, was this. The thief, that's our spiritual enemy, the devil, his purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. He's come to give us life, a rich and satisfying life, but our spiritual enemy, the devil, your spiritual enemy, the devil, wants to steal, to kill and destroy. He wants to steal your confidence, your hope, your... The, he wants to, to steal what God has given you, the freedom, the purpose of life, the mandate to bring his kingdom to bear, to, to set free the captives. He wants to kill any, any sense of life in you, any sense of uh, the dreams that you have for, to achieve God's plans and purposes. He wants to destroy your relationships. He wants to destroy the things that God is giving you. And you become vulnerable to those. When you focus on activity, when you focus on accomplishment rather than becoming, becoming, our security, our strength is becoming like Jesus who has all authority and has put the enemy under his feet so that you and I can walk in the fullness of what God has for us. You see, the more that you become like Jesus, then the more you're able to stand against the things of the enemy. You're not overwhelmed by life. You're not anxious by life. You know, one of the things that concerns me so much about the, the times in which we find ourselves is that so many of us as Christians self-censor. We don't want to cause offense. We don't want to be cancelled. We don't want to, to stand out. And so we, we moderate ourselves in our conversations. We don't live out of our faith publicly. We don't have some of the conversations that should be had to push back the purposes of the enemy in other people's lives. We've, if we don't become, then we, we end up losing so much of what God has for us. You know, <clears throat> in the scriptures, there's the, in the book of Nahum, I don't know if you've read the book of Nahum, it concerns, um, it opens with a prophecy to Nineveh, which Nineveh represents uh, the, the enemy of God. He represents all of the, or Nineveh represents all its evil, and, and Nineveh has been attacking God's people, and they can't wait for this evil to be vanquished because the evil is overwhelming them. And in, Nineveh, in Nahum, sorry, um, the prophet says, the Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust in him. You see, when we live in a time that is opposed to the things of God, our security is not to avoid, it's not to hide, it's, it's not to, to run away, it's to abide in Christ, to become more like him. He's our strong refuge. He's close to those who trust him. And that's why I ask the question, who are you becoming? Because when you are becoming more like Jesus, when you're letting him train you, then he's becoming your refuge so that you don't lose your voice, so that you don't give up what God has set you free from in order to be, bring his kingdom to bear. 
In, in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, um, Paul says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with a confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, our confidence, our hope, our joy, our peace isn't, doesn't come by avoiding conflict, by avoiding uh, engagement with the world. It, it doesn't come by, by compartmentalizing or anything like that. It comes by being filled with the Holy Spirit, becoming more like Jesus so that our source of hope, our joy, our peace, and our confidence is not determined by, by what's happening around us, but by our relationship w- with Jesus. I will compl- he wants us to, to overflow, and that means to become. Again, in John 16, verse 33, <clears throat> Jesus said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. And what's he told us? What's going to happen? How the world is going to turn against you and everything else. And he's telling that so that we can have peace in him. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome, uh, take heart because I have overcome the world. You see, in the world we have all of these things. In him we have peace. And it only comes not by believing in Jesus, but by but by abiding in him. And when we abide in him, we become who he's calling us to be. And that's why we're doing this series, because it's my concern that in these times, when Jesus is looking for people to stand in the gap, that we're disqualifying ourselves if we compartmentalize our faith, if we treat our faith as, um, as something that we've just added into our life instead of recognizing It's no longer I that lives. I'm dead to myself. It's Christ who lives in me. And now I have to become more like him so that I can not just endure trials and sorrows, but I can triumph by bringing his kingdom to bear, by living as he lived, by doing the things that he did. So let me ask you, who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? What are you actively doing in order to become more like Christ? What, what are you doing to invest in your, in, in your future by becoming more like Christ? I, I, I've put it in the question, I think. Uh, what's your next step to become more like the person Jesus has freed you to be? You see, it doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't just happen over time. It's not just, well, I became a Christian, and now look at me 15 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later. It's an investment. You know, when you went to school, you did more than eat play lunch. You engaged, you took notes, you studied, you did homework, you got help to, to, to read, to write, to understand so that you could become. And it's the same with us. If we want to become everything that God has called us to, if we want to do what he's called us to, if we want to, to live the life he's set us free to live, then we have to actively engage. So what's your next step? Maybe for some of you it's joining a connect group. Maybe for some of you it's being more regular in your connect group. Maybe for some of you, it's actually being more honest with yourself. I have my faith and I have this life, which is no life at all and no faith at all, and I need to die to this and let Jesus resurrect what he wants for me. It's about bringing things into an alignment. My faith, my life, is living like him. What's your next step in order to become who Jesus has freed you to be? And once you've identified that, then the question I'm going to ask you is simply this. What will you do to start stepping into that so that you can experience what Jesus has for you, so that you can become all that God is calling you to be and to do for the sake of others and for the sake of his kingdom? Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for your glory poured out for us that has called us, Lord, not just to sit on sidelines, has not called us just to gather on Sundays to worship, but to live your risen life, to live a life that reflects your kingdom, to live a life that is different to those who do not yet know you, to live a life that begs questioning, that invites scrutiny as people wonder, why are we like this and not like that? Why are we not being out of shape by? Why do we believe what we believe? Why, the, why is it that I feel comfortable and and secure in your presence compared to other people's. That, Lord, we would be kingdom changers as we bring your kingdom to bear. 
So Holy Spirit, have your way with us, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Hamish. And, you know, it's great to be reminded in this time of, you know, disciples making disciples and how, you know, there is a responsibility for us and to be intentional in all that we do. So you know, I encourage you to write notes and be challenged and be intentional with people in your lives and let's continue to grow and make strong community together. So I encourage you and let's be excited for what's ahead. But, you know, as we wrap up, I encourage you, let's keep growing, let's keep moving. And I encourage you, let's pray together. Let's seek him in all we do this week and be expectant of all that he's doing. Helen, do you want to pray for us as we finish? Yes. Why don't you go with me? Lord, we just thank you once again for this opportunity to gather online, to come together as a community and just um, spend take time together, even if it's online, listening to your word and your promises. Lord, we just ask that as we continue to go about the rest of our weeks, that we will live out um, what we've learned today and look for every opportunity we can to go out and um, represent you and be and be what you are to us to, to those that don't know you yet. To have your way in us and do what only you can do. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Have an incredible week and we look forward to seeing you again soon.